Notebook 6 The Accursed War and the Slaughter of September 25 From the 1st of July, 1915 to the 27th of September, 1915 Part 1 It was the night of the 1st of July. Barthes and his comrades were in the terrible battlefield of Notre Dame de Lorette and had been recently moved up to a sector of the front-line trenches, a few hundred meters from the ruined and German-held village of Angres, and only fifty meters from the German lines proper. That night, Barthes' 13th squad was set to take its turn up front as sentries at the firing line, from midnight until daybreak. The 14th squad had the shift before them, but at 9 p.m. their corporal, a man called Marty, told Barthas he was not feeling well and asked if they could switch places. Barthas was happy to oblige. The night continued and at midnight the 13th squad was relieved by the 14th. The squad's three newcomers were shocked that the German positions were so close to their own and their terror was such that they did not dare raise their heads over the parapet. The rest of the squad's veterans did their best to calm them down. By this time, Corporal Marty was feeling better, and he urged Barthes to go rest a bit. Marty would take his place with the squad. So, Barthes left, stretched out in the communication trench, and fell into a nice, peaceful sleep. But suddenly, he was shaken awake by a terrible explosion, followed by cries and moans. The trench was filled with smoke, and a man stumbled and collapsed right next to him. He was Corporal Marty. He cried, Help me! Don't leave me! Barthas rushed to him, and, under the light of another comrade's lamp, he cut open Marty's greatcoat and shirt. It revealed a horrible wound, all along Marty's side which gushed blood in fountains. With a cold-bloodedness which he never thought he was capable of, Barthas managed to temporarily stop the hemorrhaging. At that moment, a medical officer and two stretcher-bearers appeared. They had been immediately brought by the section chief, Sub-Lieutenant Malvezi, who had to practically drag them there by force. Bartha said he had to congratulate the sub-lieutenant for his devotion to duty, and forgave him for some future troubles he would give to Barthas and the other men. The medical officer tried to examine Marty's wound, but the poor man flailed and screamed in pain. It was certain that the Germans, barely fifty meters away, could hear everything. Shut your goddamn mouth, said the medical officer brutally. These were all the words of comfort Marty received on the verge of death, with a shattered body and far from his loved ones. Marty cried, My poor children, I will never see you again. Then he started praying with all his faith calling upon the Virgin Mary and St. Theresa, who, he had told Barthas many times, was the protector of wounded men. But Bartha said that no miracle occurred. Death struck down the true believer just as blindly as the unrepentant atheist, and Marty died before reaching the dressing station. To Barthas this showed how in this war the tiniest circumstances and coincidences could make all the difference between life and death. If, at 9 p.m., Marty had not suffered from a headache, in all probability Barthas would have been the one who would have had his chest torn open by shrapnel. It hurt him much that such a good man as Marty died in his place. But there was no time to grieve Marty. There were more wounded men and they had to look around. The shell had claimed a terrible toll. They found Private Favier, one of the newcomers, unconscious, with blood flowing from numerous wounds. They brought the medical officer, but he said there was nothing they could do. The sub-lieutenant brought stretcher-bearers to take him away, but Favier died right as he reached the field hospital. Private Favier had come with the last reinforcements, and this was his first night on the front line. He had been terrified by the bombardments, and Barthas and the other veterans had to try and reassure him, despite being scared themselves. When Favier had climbed to the firing step, 
Barthas had to stay next to him for a little while. They had no protection there, and to observe the fields it was necessary to raise their heads over the parapet. Favier was terrified by this, and crouched at every noise from the battlefield. Barthas tried to help him, and suggested that he fill a couple of sandbags to make a small crenellation behind which he would be better protected. The poor man had listened to him, and when they found him lying there on the trench floor, he was still holding a sandbag in his arms. Barthas felt guilty for this. Perhaps he had been the unwitting cause of Favier's death. If he had not suggested him the idea of filling sandbags, then Favier would not have been at that dangerous spot when the shell fell. Dawn was breaking, and with the light those who were safe and sound started helping the wounded. Barthas first helped his friend Tort, who was sitting at the firing step and crying, saying that he had a shattered leg. When they inspected his leg, they only found a tiny scratch on his heel, from which not a single drop of blood fell. They teased Tort for being such a crybaby, but it turned out to be a shell fragment which had burrowed into his bone. It brought gangrene, and Tort's leg had to be amputated. For a month he would waver between life and death, and then Tort, forty-one years old, was sent back to his village of Rio Minerva as an invalid. And there were still many other wounded. When the big shell had hit, Gabriel Gilles had been a few steps behind the trench, answering to a call of nature. He got a shell fragment in his back, which he would keep for the rest of his life. A few days later that fragment brought a pulmonary congestion which almost killed him. Jordi got a shell fragment in the knee, and Barthas had to put a rudimentary dressing on it. Sergeant Baruto had been sleeping at the firing step, and had his leg torn up by shrapnel. Other soldiers from the 14th squad, which had been sitting or lying on the firing step, had also been wounded. All in all, this single shell claimed around 15 victims. It had been a bloody reaping indeed. Barthas wrote that he had once again been saved from this by that strange instinct he had felt several times previously. When he had been looking for a spot to sleep on the firing step, the sudden idea came to him to stretch out at the bottom of the trench. He risked being trampled by passers-by, but no shell fragments could reach him there. The Peirasa Louis Allard also had a close call. A fragment struck and shattered the hilt of his bayonet, which had been on the ground right next to him. This made the fragment lose strength, and it did not hit Allard. His bayonet was supposed to stay on the end of his rifle at all times, but this infraction of regulations likely saved his life. Their trench was now filled with wounded, but no one dared to go to the first aid station, where their cruel chief medical officer was on duty. The brute would pay no attention to wounded men, saying that their wounds were not serious enough to justify medical aid, and... When heavily wounded men arrived, he would burst into rage, screaming that they were wasting his time by sending him corpses which were beyond his powers to save. If the men left the front-line trench without medical certification, they risked a court-martial. Luckily, Sub-Lieutenant Malvezi managed to take the wounded into a nearby field station where the Major was nowhere to be seen. Before they left, the soldiers said goodbye to the wounded men, exchanging handshakes and embraces with sad hearts, knowing that these separations would be definitive. Then the wounded departed, disappearing into the communication trenches while hobbling and helping each other along. Barthas and the other soldiers who remained buried all the broken rifles and shredded packs which littered the ground and got rid of the blood-soaked mud. Just like that, all signs of the tragic night disappeared, as if nothing had ever happened. Soon after, the rationer Therese arrived. He had left in the evening to look for their food, and was shocked when he saw how Barthas was covered in blood. Barthas explained what had happened, 
and then they all sat down to eat their rations with great appetite. At ten in the evening the 281st Infantry Regiment came to relieve them, and three hours later Barthas and his comrades arrived at their billets in Hersan Coupigny. This was a big mining town that was almost a city and was within range of the German guns, which from time to time sent volleys of shells its way. The men were lodged in a dance hall that had been turned into a human stable. There was no straw and the men had to sleep on the brick floor. That day, the squad went to the town cemetery and gathered around the grave of their unlucky comrade Favier. Three days later, they were sent to camp in the village of saint Zangohel, and the next day they were sent to the town of bully -Grenet. This endless wandering from one place to another was exhausting. To Barthas they were going from purgatory to hell and from hell back to purgatory. bully -Grenet was bombarded daily, but still its inhabitants would not abandon it. If their house collapsed, they settled in their cellars or took refuge with a neighbor. During one of Barthas' stays there, an entire family except the father was wiped out by artillery fire. But still, this tragedy did not convince the town's inhabitants to leave their homes. At this town, their company received a few reinforcements. Barthas' squad received two young lads who knew nothing about the trenches except what appeared in the newspapers, and a priest, the Abbé Gallo, who had been expelled from France by the laws of separation of the church from the state, but who with the war had returned to defend the homeland which had exiled him. However, together with these three reinforcements, the squad lost Louis Allard, who managed to get a job as a truck driver, due to his being 41 years old. On the 10th of July at 9 in the evening, they left Bouly and occupied a second-line trench for four days. The bombardments had diminished considerably here, and it was practically a sector for rest, but this was spoiled on the 14th of July, when the French artillery decided to remind the Germans through a particularly violent bombardment that this was the French national holiday. The Germans answered in kind, but instead of firing on the artillery, they fired on the infantrymen, who had nothing to do with it. This made it so suddenly Barthes' 13th squad found itself in a section of abandoned trench, surrounded by explosions. There was no shelter against the German shells here, so Barthes ordered his men to immediately leave the position. Only the priest, Father Gallo, refused to follow them. Barthes tried to tell Gallo about the tragic death of Mondier, who had also refused to follow them and paid the ultimate price for it. But the priest would not listen, staying on his knees resigned to his fate and reciting the act of contrition. So the rest of the squad left. When they returned later, they found that several shells had fallen near their positions, and one had fallen right in the middle of the trench. Father Gallo, however, was safe and sound, and still praying. Now it is to thank God for saving my life, a real miracle, he said. Soon after, thunder mixed with the roar of the cannons, and rain started to fall in sheets. This, at least, appeased the rage of the artillery. The company only had a few wounded and one man who had been killed and buried by a shell. The rain did not stop. Night arrived and the men waited for a unit that was going to replace them, but it did not appear. Hours passed with the soldiers standing immobile in the rain until at ten in the evening their replacements finally came. It turned out they had gotten lost in the darkness and the trenches which the rain had turned into sewers. As they departed, Barthes' company also got lost in that maze and had to slog through mud and water for six hours, covering perhaps fifteen to twenty kilometers to reach the third line which had only been one kilometer in a straight line from their previous positions. At daybreak they came to their new positions, the Tranchée Carbonnière, a field surrounded by trenches where each day all the dead of the sector were buried. Despite the large size of the field, 
it risked becoming too small to hold both the living and dead. The soaked and freezing soldiers were disappointed to find that there were no shelters for them here. Of course, there were a few shelters, but these were occupied exclusively by the officers. The soldiers were supposed to lie down on the mud and sleep exposed to the elements. Some of the soldiers were so exhausted that they did just that. But a good-sized group of Poilus did not accept this injustice and gathered in front of the shelter of their provisional company commander, the crazy sub-lieutenant Camnad. They shouted and protested. Some few even dared to sing the Internationale, the socialist anthem which was the ultimate sign of revolt for the Poilus. Camnad burst from his shelter in anger. What is this all about? he said. You are complaining and you're not wrong to do so, but what do you want? We are at war. And, with this cynical justification, he returned to his comfortable shelter while the sergeant of the day handed out work details. Barthas was assigned to a crew of twenty men to take water to the town of Bouligrenet, which was two kilometers away, through the communication trenches. This accursed chore involved every pair of men carrying a 50-liter keg of water suspended from a pole through kilometers of narrow and twisting communication trench that often had low roofs of barbed wire, making the job seem interminable. After that, for three nights, the Poilus were employed hauling heavy wooden beams and rafters from a mine seven or eight kilometers from the front line. Since they had been so loud in their complaints for shelters, now they would build them, though these shelters would be for their successors. The mine was a source of vast quantities of lumber, and the Germans knew it, so it was bombarded day and night, making the place very dangerous. Until that point, no chief had wanted to risk his men's lives sending them there, but Kamnad risked their lives without scruple. Bartha said that at least no one was wounded, and when they departed the Tranchée Carbonière, they left behind some good-sized and almost completed shelters. On the 18th of July at one in the morning, their battalion arrived at the town of Harsan coupigny to spend seven days of rest. They were billeted by squads in small storage areas of the town's brick houses. They were packed like sardines, but they were used to it, and they were so tired that they slept until nine in the morning. After resting and cleaning up a bit, the two oldest veterans of the squad, Airi and La Pelle, invited Barthas to go with them to the company's field kitchen, which had set up shop in the open air at a crossroads with the town's main road. Barthas was ready to follow them when suddenly he was overcome by a sense of worry, anguish and fear. It was the feeling of imminent danger. Mondier and others he had known had sensed their imminent doom. Many others had escaped death, guided by that strange intuition they didn't know they had. And Barthas had felt it before. He looked around him. They were in the middle of a peaceful village. The streets were bustling with activity. Children were playing, housewives were gossiping at their doorsteps, and non-coms flirted with pretty blondes. Where could danger come from? Could his intuition be wrong? Barthas did not tell his comrades what he was feeling because they would have made fun of him, but he did not follow them, saying that he had something to do. Looking around, Barthas did not know where to go to escape the unknown danger. Following an impulse, he entered a shop where postcards with scene of the war in the town nearby were being sold, until recently the censors had prohibited their sale. Barthas entered with private Ventresque, and they bought a couple of these postcards. They were on their way out when suddenly a series of explosions shook everything. A skylight roof nearby was shattered by a big steel fragment, and the street was showered in broken glass. The terrified shopkeeper and her family ran to the basement, leaving the two soldiers alone. A volley of powerful time-fused shells had fallen on her son. Ventresk and Barthas rushed back to their billet. There they learned that three powerful shells had fallen right onto the crossroads where their field kitchen had stood. 
The four cooks were critically injured. The kitchen had its chimney knocked off and the cooking pot was blown apart. They would not eat that day. Irie also received a serious wound in his arm and it had to be amputated, while Le Pere had a piece of his calf as big as a chestnut sliced off by a shell fragment and the wound poured blood like a fountain. All in all, the company had twelve wounded, all of whom had been chatting and standing around the field kitchen. Luckily, less than a hundred meters away there was a military hospital, and the wounded were given immediate medical attention. The next day, Barthas and the rest of the squad went to the hospital for news of La Peira and Airi, but found the doors locked and the building empty. Because of the bombardment, all the wounded had been evacuated during the night, and the hospital had been closed down. And so, just like that, of all the veterans of the 13th squad, Barthas was the only one left fighting, along with their rationer Therese. I think this is a good spot to stop for today. We have seen how, without warning, this war could claim the lives of dozens of men. Often what determined if one lived or died was just coincidence, luck. If you were standing in the wrong place at the wrong time, that could be it. In less than twenty days, Barthes' squad lost six men. And, in less than nine months of fighting on the front lines, the only ones of the original squad that now remain are Barthes and Therese. On the next episode, we will continue with the second part of this notebook, for the war is still less than a year old at this point, and it has much more to go before it ends. I hope you all remain well and safe, and I'll see you next time.